In module two, we're going to talk about the Nexus 9000 hardware platform. We're going to talk about the roles that switches have in the ACI fabric. We're going to talk about spines and leafs. And then we're going to talk about the ASICs, the chips that power, the switch on chips that power the Nexus 9000 family. Okay, let's talk about single fabric and multiple fabric ACI topologies. What we've talked about most, for mostly um, what we've talked about so far is the single fabric production topology. We have anywhere between two to six spines in a production fabric. Uh, we show four here. Typically we're going to see two, but we can have up to six spines. The connectivity between leaf and spine is going to be 40 gig or 100 gig. And right now, depending on whether or not you're going to do a, layer, a large layer 3 fabric or a typical layer 3 fabric or layer 2 fabric, we have anywhere between 80 to 200 leaves that are supported um, in, in one of these topologies. It is considered a single pod technology, or a topology rather. So it will show up as pod 1. And we can have anywhere between 3 to 5 APIC controller nodes. 3 is typical. The only reason why you would increase to 5 is because you had a high rate of change, so you're really banging away at the, your APIC nodes. But for, the most, uh, for most installations, 3 is sufficient to spread out um, workload and uh, still have a, a good degree of re resiliency. <clears throat> 5 doesn't actually get you any more in redundancy because we're only we're only doing three replicas. Even if you have five nodes, you still have only three replicas. So another way to, to consider this is single fabric, single pod, single APIC cluster, what a lot of, probably the majority of, of ACI installations are. We also have the lab topology. Of course, this wouldn't be, uh, we're only gonna have one spine and it typically is going to be a 9336PQ, the baby spine and two leaves and a single APIC controller instead of a cluster. Um, for lab environments, a proof of concept environments or testing environments, this is sufficient, of course, with a lack of redundancy in spines and <clears throat> the APIC cluster, it's not really, um, it's not really um, gonna be good for anything production-wise. Um, with a single cluster, <clears throat> a single APIC node, you're gonna see this error right here saying your cluster contains less than three in-service controllers, so it's gonna, gonna complain about that but it's perfectly fine, perfectly functional for labs and testing. Now we have some options for doing stretching out our fabric between multiple geographic locations or scaling it out be, uh, in a different way than we have before. First, we have the stretched fabric. This, is, this has been around for a little while. This involves having two sets of spines we not ev we're not doing a full mesh here, so this might be our our delineation between uh, site one and site two. They might be separated by a larger distance, or maybe just another building, or or something. Um, for whatever and for whatever reason, we're not going to do a full mesh. So we have what we call transit leaves that are connected to both sets of spines, and the rest of them are connected to their own unique spines. We can also split out our APIC controller node amongst the two uh, locations. The next one we have, uh, we call dual fabric, dual domain. And right here, we've got a split. So we have some sort of layer two or layer three interconnect between the two. We've got two separately independently managed ACI fabrics. So these are just two regular fabrics that, are, that have a DCI in between them, some sort of data center interconnect in between them. And they are connected via layer two or layer three. Um, if it's layer two, we can we can do VM mobility, so we can take a VM and migrate it from one location to another, and and this allows us to do dual fabric, dual domain. And we'll talk about that as well. And finally, this is new to ACI 2.0. The Congo release is we have the capability to do what's called a multi-pod fabric, so it's still considered the same fabric. So we've still got one fabric. But now we've broken it off into multiple pods. And the different pods connect to each other through something called the interpod network or the IPN, which we'll talk about. It's a single uh, managed fabric, so we have the single point of management there. So ACI stretched and multi-pod design goals. Why are we doing this? Um, one, we want to provide mo IP mobility. So uh, typically that means supporting the motion from one location to another location, whether again, whether that's across a street, 
uh, downstairs or upstairs or uh, hundreds of miles away. We want to be able to have the same IP address in both locations, so have the same address space. Um, we want a single fabric, so one configuration management point is often a goal there, although if we have the dual fabric, uh, dual location scenario, that's not going to be the case, but we have some tools that can help us out there. Oftentimes, it's geographic diversity. We want to have multiple data centers, and we want to have them geographically dispersed uh, for, for active active or active standby, we, uh, for disaster recovery and so forth. However, right now, to keep in mind, there is a 10 millisecond uh, round trip time limit. Uh, so that's about 800 kilometers or 500 miles, depending on whether you use uh, Imperial Metric. Um, and that's the limit. And primarily, that's, a, that's the tested limit. Now, could you get away with something a little bit longer? Probably. As far as I know, ACI doesn't do any latency checks between different leaves to see how far away they are. But in terms of um, syncing up objects, sharded objects in the in the APIC data store, that's what's been tested for 10 milliseconds. Longer distances might work, but that's what's been validated. Another reason why we might want to do some other topology is we have a high-scale single data center, so that re would require third tier of spines for aggregation. Perhaps we have some space limitations or cabling limitations. Um, especially if we're doing multiple rows, like many, many, many rows. We still want to have a single fabric, but we want to break them off into pods um, and without fully meshing everything. So we might have a situation where we don't want to necessarily mesh everything together. So we'll do a three-tier instead of a two, a three-tier cloth instead of a two-tier cloth. So let's talk about the stretch fabric. Again, this has been available for a little while. What it involves uh, for a stretch fabric is, at least in production, we're typically going to have two spines in every location. Although if you want to do like a proof of concept for a stretch fabric, you can get away with just one in each location. Um, we, we've done that in our lab environment before. Uh, but production-wise, we're going to have at least two. Typically, we're not going to have more than two in a stretch fabric, and we'll talk about why in a minute. We have our three APIC controllers split between two different uh, geographic locations. So we're stretching between these two. Um, we do have VM mobility, so that is a capability we have. Um, so we can migrate a virtual machine from one leaf to another leaf um, and on the other side of the stretch. Um, one thing to keep in mind uh, in terms of uh, the models of these transit leaves, atomic counters because of the ASIC and the first generation, the ALEs, um, will not work correctly if um, the transit leaves are these ALE-based uh, systems. So that ALE, as opposed to the ALE2, the ALE2+, plus, or the LSE. So the ALE is what's in the 12-port gem module that goes into the 9396 or the 93128. If you have the six port gem module, that is the ALE2. If you have the six port gem module with a dash E after it, that's the ALE2+. Plus. If you have the 93108 or the 93180 EXs, or, uh, E's, uh, EXs um, they are LSE based. So they will so they support atomic counters between these two different uh, sides of the fabric. We're gonna have route reflectors in both locations to distribute routes that we learned in, uh, from the uh, border leaves. So if I have a router here, I learn outside routes. They get sent into the route reflectors and then get sent to the different, uh, uh, to the other leaves. Um, as of ACI 2.0, uh, uh, you can have up to six route reflectors. The limit used to be two. So if you had a stretch fabric, you typically do just one uh, route reflector here, one route reflector there. But as, as of ACI 2.0, you can now have six. Again, we have that 10 millisecond uh, round trip response time. So that translates into roughly 800 kilometers or 500 miles in terms of our maximum distance. And that's just based on the speed of light through typically fiber. Now, in order to connect these transit leaves to our remote spines, We've got three options. We can do dark fiber, um, and that's limited because of the optics to 40 kilometers or about 24 miles. We also have DWDM and Ethernet over MPLS pseudo wire, and those both give us 800 kilometers and 500 miles. So let's talk about dark fiber. Depending on the optic that you use, the long range optics, the LR optics, we can do 10 kilometers, 10 kilometers, two kilometers, 
And with a QSFP 40 gig uh, ER4, we can do up to 40 kilometers as of 1.1. The 1.0 release supported only 30 kilometers, but now we've got 40 kilometers. It's about, uh, I think that's 25, uh, 24 miles, roughly. So that's how far you can put these, these two, the stretched fabric. This is how far you can stretch it. If we have DWDM, we can, um, again, we're still limited to the same distance maximum of 800 kilometers or 500 miles. In this diagram here, and the, I think the previous one too, nope, yeah. In this diagram here, we are only doing one transit leaf per location instead of two. Partly because sometimes that's your only option because you have a limited number of uh, DWDM um, hookups there. Um, or, you know, limited number of links. Um, of course, it's not as redundant as having two transit leaves, but you can do just one. So our leaf spine interfaces, one of the limitations here is that these spine interfaces are 40 gig or 100 gig. So we're going to connect them over uh, 40 gig DWDM, or we can break it out into, for example, we can take the QSFP and break it out into four channels run it over DWDM as four by 10 gig, and then get it back into the transit leaf. And then it'll show up 40 gig here and 40 gig here. And that's really what we care about is these interfaces are 40 gig. And then finally, we have um, ethernet over MPLS pseudo wire. We have the ability, um, we can do just 10 gigs. So this can be a 10 gig link, 10 gig or better between the two different locations. ASR 9000s are required because of the, uh, because of the QoS uh, that's required to put in between these two sites. Oops. Um, so 10 gig or better. QoS, uh, also 10 millisecond round trip return time, which translates into 800 kilometers and f or about 500 miles. So our transit leaf will be connected by a pseudo wire all the way up to that spine, this transit leaf, pseudo wire up to that spine. Again, the spine interfaces and the leaf interfaces, those are gonna be 40 gig or 100 gig, but uh, typically we're just gonna do um, uh, that depending on what our interface availability is. We also can do a three site stretched fabric. In that case, because we're in a, any given fabric, we're limited to um, this is considered the same pod. So we're, we're li we used to say we're limited to six spines per fabric, but we're really limited to six spines per six spines per pod. So that'll be two spines per physical location. We do have to mesh via the transit leaves. So the transit leaves have to plug into all of our spines. We're gonna split off our APIC controller between the three different locations. Although we could do um, two in one, just wouldn't have one there, for example, or we can actually do three in one, but typically we're, we're gonna have one to ha wanna have something local. Um, and in terms of redundancy, if I make a write to this APIC, the actual write object that I'm doing to, the, the, the primary uh, replica might be over here. So the ape, when I do the write here, the write actually gets proxied over to where the primary replica is, the write is done it gets disseminated to the two secondary um, replicas. And then we get a notice saying that that write has been complete and, and back again. That's one of the reasons why we have that 10 millisecond response time, because anything more than that, we're gonna start to degrade performance in terms of responsiveness of the APIC cluster. And since we have a limit of six route reflectors, we might as well put a route reflector on each spine. We can do just one per spine, but why not just do, it takes like an extra couple of seconds. Do six route reflectors, that way each location has some redundancy there. And again, our latencies. One thing to keep in mind when we're stretching these fabrics, from a networking perspective, and a, and a lot of times even from an application developer perspective or, or an ar application architect perspective, they think, okay, great. Well, now we've got this VM mobility. I can migrate a VM from one site to another. Case closed. Not really. 10 milliseconds is what we need for the APIC cluster, although uh, VMware can do long distance vMotion. The, right now, the, the vMotion limit is 150 milliseconds, which is pretty far. That's, um, I, I forget how far that's 
like from here is from North America to Europe at least. So it's a pretty good distance. Um, that doesn't mean an application can withstand having two different nodes and that far apart. For example, if I have a VM here and I have another VM here, and let's say this is my database layer and this is my app layer, or maybe it's a collapsed apps, app and presentation or web layer, and I do a write, the application does a write to the database, the database is going to give us an acknowledgement. That write acknowledgement might take, if it's, um, if it's 150 milliseconds, it might take a, or 150 milliseconds around trip time, it's going to take us 150 milliseconds to get that write done. That's a significant amount of lag, especially if you want to snap the application. Some applications are just fine with it, and some applications will go south, will get into race conditions and locking and so forth, or performance will just be unacceptable. So just because we can uh, do that migration between two different sites doesn't necessarily mean that we have uh, that it's a good idea. For some applications, even 10 milliseconds is, is a bit too much. So if you're going to be if you're using in-house developer, developers, make sure that they test their applications, having part of their application stack in one location, part of them in the other. If you're doing prepackaged applications, make sure to do part of your acceptance testing is to run them in different sites and see how they respond. They may not respond how you think they respond, depending on the latency. Multipod, uh, this is new with 2.0, as I mentioned. So this is part of the Congo release. We can do a multipod topology. What does that mean? Well, it's sort of a three layer uh, clause. So we have our two tier, we have our leaves and our spines, and then we have a second tier of spines up here. And that is represented by our IPN or interpod network. So we have an, a pod here, we have a pod here. A pod is a collection of spines and leaves that are just connected to each other. And then the spines are connected into an upper layer. Now, you may have heard me in previous sections talking about the only thing that plugs into a spine are other leaves. We don't plug uh, routers into spines. This is an exception here. Uh, we're going to plug these spines into uh, layer three uh, network here. The, right here, that doesn't need to be Cisco. That can actually be other vendors. Uh, and we'll talk about what the requirements are, but uh, other vendors can certainly uh, fit, that, fit that bill there. Of course, our spines and leaves here still need to be Cisco 9000, uh, but these up here may not need to be Cisco. So some sort of layer three network. The Again, the, the limitation between the pods in terms of how much latency we can have between the two different pods is 10 milliseconds round trip time. So why would we want to do this? Um, oh yeah, um, spines plug into our interpod network. We have, this is a single cluster. So two in one site, uh, one in another, if we're going to have two pods, and we'll talk about what we do when we have more than two pods. Right now up to four is supported. Six is coming relatively soon, I think, according to Cisco Live. So probably by the end of 2016. Although don't, you know, always subject to change. Uh, any, anything they say in Cisco Live, they always say, you know, we're announcing it. It's always subject to change. So that's certainly true there as well. We have a single APIC cluster three APIC nodes, and we'll talk about why three and not um, not five, which is the maximum currently. So it's a single fabric. We're just, m we're actually going to have multiple pods. And we support vMotion and, and, and network uh, availability in, in multiple locations. So we can actually vMotion from one pod to another. The same IP addresses, the same default gateways, the same policies will all be there. So it's one pod, one or uh, multiple pods, but one fabric. Another note here: not all spines need to connect to the IPM. So if we if we don't need to do a full mesh, so we can have a situation where only two of our spines are connected into our IPN, or all of them. So it doesn't matter. So why would we want to do this? Well, there's two primary use cases that Cisco has uh, implemented this for. One is geographic diversity. That's a very common ask that we get is we want to have two different data center sites. So we've got site number one here. We've got data center site number two. Again, 10 milliseconds round trip time. And we just want it for HA, either doing active active or active standby, depending on, on how we architect things. And still be able to have that VM, that VM mobility between different sites. So I can move a VM from one location to another in case we have some sort of um, issue. And it's one fabric, one policy um, across all of these uh, pods. 
Another issue is maybe we need to scale out our the number of leaves and or scale out our to a really high number of leaves, um, and we don't want to buy a huge number of spines. So we can actually aggregate our spines or our leaves from these spines and then do further aggregation up. So we don't need as many of these devices to connect to our spines in a given pod and then have multiple leaves off of that. So it can help out with cabling in terms of not having to do such a crazy, not, not quite such a full mesh. Saves on ports, saves on cabling, and saves on um, a number of devices overall. So this could be in the same data center. They could be on different floors of the same data center, but that's one of the one of uh, Cisco's customers asked for this, and so that's what that's what Cisco came up with. So the multipod limits in ACI 2.0. Right now, it's a limit of four pods. We can do six spines per pods, 200 nodes per pod, and then 300 nodes total for a given fabric. So if you have one pod that has 200 nodes, then you can only do 100 nodes in the next pod, or you can do two other pods with 50 nodes. You know, you know the drill. So a total of 300 nodes total, and that includes the the um, the spines. We do three APIC nodes, not five, and we'll talk about why we're going to do that. So three APIC controller nodes, and we can either put them all in one pod, two in one pod, and one in another, or we can completely split them across our pods. For the IPN, so this is what it, we are doing to connect uh, pod one and pod two here. So pod one spines, pod two for four, sp two through four spines. They're all connected typically redundantly into a pair of routers or network devices that are in our IPN. So here are the requirements. Uh, first off, they do not need to be Cisco. There's one case where you might want it to be Cisco, but they don't have to be Cisco as long as they have all these IPN requirements. One, these interfaces here need to be 40 or 100 gig. So we need to be able to plug them in there. Um, and, and that's primarily because the interfaces on the spine are 40 or 100 gig. The, it needs to support bi-directional PIM, and that's primarily for the BUM traffic that we need to disseminate. So that's the broadcast, unknown newcast, multicast. DHCP relay, so pod one right here. When we add a new spine, for example, we add a new pod, we put a couple of spines in them. They're gonna do a DHCP request. It's gonna go through the IPN network, down through these spines, down to the leaves, and down into the, um, in, into the APIC controllers and get their IP addresses that way. So we need DHCP relay. We need OSPF. We only need OSPF here between the, the spine and the, uh, the border of our IPN, whatever that is. Um, and it just runs here. So if, you need, if you're running a different routing protocol like IS to IS inside of your IPN, no problem. We're just going to redistribute OSPF routes into that and then um, redistribute back into our spines. So for that right there, that needs to be OSPF. And that's how we brought, that's how we disseminate uh, TEP reachability. We need to increase MTU. Remember, uh, ACI is based on VXLAN, IVXLAN. That requires a larger uh, payload size. So typically, something over 9,000 bytes is a safe bet in case we do um, in case we do jumbo frames on our VMs or on our hosts. But certainly, at least enough overhead to handle the uh, the uh, VXLAN header, which should not be too much of a problem. We need to do some QoS, so we need to have some QoS that we need to do on, on these devices just to make sure the right traffic gets through. Again, they don't need to be Cisco. The IPN, this network right here, this is not configured through the APIC, so this is a separate configuration point. It's, of course, if it's not gonna be Cisco, if the APIC's not gonna uh, interact there, but we can do, um, but we're gonna manage that separately. And it makes sense because typically the team that manages this network it's going to be different than the team that manages ACI. Uh, also, sub-interfaces, the the point-to-point -point connection between each spine interface, we're going to run out over VLAN 4. Why VLAN 4? We wanted to make it as simple as possible, and that's what was supported initially. Um, and it just needs to be this interface VLAN 4 and this interface, uh, a sub-interface VLAN 4. So those, are, so those are what's required for the interpod network. As long as you've got that, we should be able to build uh, a multi-pod fabric. A couple of considera uh, considerations when we're designing and, and, and scoping out our, our multi-pod network. Each pod will have a separate IP pool for TEPs. When you did your initial configuration of a given fa 
fabric, you gave it a tep pool, something like 100016. And that's just for the tep addresses that are going to go on the different devices, even inside of the APICs themselves. The APIC controllers will have their own um, address off the tep space. Every pod's going to have a unique uh, address pool and non-overlapping address pool. Now, it doesn't matter what address pool you use because this is part of the infrastructure network and these routes never get leaked outside of the fabric. They never get announced outside. So just an internal network. They can overlap with any of your tenants or any of your outside networks and won't cause a problem. Um, spine nodes redistribute, redistribute through, other, for, through um, other pods. More than No more than two APICs recommended per pod. Um, zero APICs in a given pod are allowed. So those are so so those are some considerations. In terms of getting to the outside world in your multi-pod environment, we can do our WAN router. We can mul we can peer multiple locations, but our WAN router typically will plug it into a pair of leafs here. Whatever routing protocol we're going to run there, it'll get distributed through um, MPBGP. Um, through yeah through through the route reflectors up here, so it'll get um, it'll get uh, not a PPGP. It'll get um, it'll get redistributed through the route reflectors up here. So whatever routes we learn in the round router are going to get disseminated by a route reflector to the other leaves, and then will also get disseminated into the other spines, which then get disseminated into the other leaves through route reflectors locally. So that's supported there. Um, we can dual home or multi-home or have multiple peering. That's perfectly acceptable too. And uh, if a VM is here and the n network is now th the same outside network is available here and here, it's going to go out the local shortest path there. So those are that's applicable. So any border router doesn't need to be Cisco. is supported through static routes. So we can do static routes here, OSPF, EIGRP, well, that's primarily Cisco and then IBGP. We also have the option of, um, we also have the option of putting our border router as part of the IPN. This is called Gulf, or Cisco internally called this Gulf. The, the border routers that are supported through automatic configuration are the ASR 9000, the ASR 1000, and the Nexus 7K with the F3 uh, line cards. Um, um, and then that way we can send traffic out through so the VM full gateway is, of course, the local leaf typically, and then the traffic will get forwarded and peered and, and announced and sent out through the border router as part of the IPN rather than through a, a border leaf. So the router configuration here, uh, you can do the router configuration manual, but part of the ACI is that we need to be dynamic, so we can, it'll also use OpFlex to um, do that configuration. So what are the APIC cluster considerations for stretched fabric? I've alluded to this a number of times so far. So if we have multi-site or we're doing stretch pods, stretch fabrics or whatever, we're typically going to want to distribute our APIC nodes across multiple data centers. A couple things to keep in mind. Every piece of data, uh, every configuration point in the ACI is considered an object. Every object is replicated three times. One of the replicas out of three is considered the primary replica and the other two are standby. So as long as a primary replica is available, that's where we make our writes to. And that's the authoritative replica. And then that is copied over into the, to the other, uh, into other two other locations. Um, also, we need to have a quorum of nodes in the cluster. So we need to have a majority of the nodes in a cluster in order to make writes. If we do not, then we cannot make writes. We can do reads, we can do, we can do some uh, logins and so forth, but we, may, we can't make writes. So here's some considerations. If we have a failure in the data center that has just a single, um, that has just a single APIC node in it, we have no data loss. Configuration, configuration changes are still possible because now these two have a quorum. There's a majority of the nodes in a cluster are now available. This guy over here, let's say this is not available because of a fiber cut or something. So everything is still running in this secondary data center. It wasn't hit by an asteroid or anything. It is still running, 
but we don't have the ability to make any writes because there's only one out of three and it notices that it's all by its lonesome. It does not have a quorum, so it goes into a read-only mode. That way I can't make a write over here and then I can make a this write to the same object over here and now we have an inconsistency, uh, which is the thing we try to avoid in a split brain. So this is part of the split brain avoidance mechanism. Once the data center comes back online, it rejoins the cluster and becomes fit again and gets uh, updates of all the replicas. If we have a failure in our primary data center, or in this case, whatever data center has two of our APIC nodes, the APIC cluster, no data loss. There's still no data loss because when we only have three nodes in a cluster, we still have a copy of every piece of data because if we only have three nodes and three replicas, that means every replica has to go on every node. So even if our primary data center was hit by an asteroid, so here's an asteroid, comes in and gets hit by an asteroid, completely wipes it out, we still have no data loss. But our configuration is, we can't make any configuration changes at this point because we only have one out of the three. We don't have a quorum. So to prevent overwrites and inconsistencies, we do not do any, um, we do not do any writes. One thing you can do in that case to deal with that is to bring up a spare. So that might be an APIC node that you have just lying around. It's not configured, it's not running. It might be plugged in, but it's not powered on. Or if it's powered on, we haven't gone through the setup script yet. So what we can do is we can bring it up, we can decommission the, the dead nodes. So if they're decommissioned, if they do come up and we do get connectivity, they just say, hey, we're done. And typically what we'll do is just wipe them, which doesn't, doesn't matter because we still have our um, no data loss because we still have an authoritative copy in, in the, the surviving data center. We're gonna bring up this new node and then we're gonna add it to the cluster and it's gonna sync up and now we have a quorum out of three. Again, we'll just decommission these two, then reboot them with a wipe so that they come up clean. And then if it comes back up, we just bring one of them back up and we'll have two here. And it, as long as you have, what we really want is we want to make sure that we have three nodes in the cluster long term. We can't have four. It's going to complain. Not a good idea long term. We can also do five, but here's why five is a bad idea. If I put three of my APIC nodes here and three of my APIC nodes here. Because we're splitting our replicas across three nodes, not every node now has every piece of data. Some nodes are missing data. Now we can still hit every node and make a configuration change. So for example, if I have a piece of, uh, I have a configuration object that exists here, here, and here, if I make a change to that object on that particular node, no problem, it will find out whichever one is the primary. So I'm gonna say it's that one. The cha changes will get written there and then replicated to the other two. So let's say we have a piece of configuration data that is on these three. Now, not all of them are gonna be like that. It's spread, it's evenly spread roughly, uh, deterministically across all five. And let's say these three die for whatever reason, we have a catastrophic data center failure, a flood, a tornado, some natural disaster. These three die, now I've got data loss. I still have an active cluster because I have a quorum over here, but now I've got data loss. So typically for stretched fabrics or multipod fabrics, we're gonna wanna do just three. And then possibly spare. So a second AP can be brought online, the cluster be made fit. So that's actually a technical term, they call it a fit cluster, and then changes can be made. Another solution, and this has been available for a long time, is we would call it ACM multi-fabric uh, design. So what we do is we have actually right here and right here, we have two independent ACI fabrics. So this is fabric one, this is fabric two. There, if you cannot configure any policy over here from here and vice versa. So there are two independently managed fabrics that happen to have a DCI in between them. So that could be dark fiber, it could be something like OTV. Now, if you're gonna do it this way, whatever you stretch, whatever 
whatever bridge domains that you're going to stretch, whatever APNs you're going to stretch, we have to follow a rule. One VLAN, one bridge domain, one EPG. So every bridge domain can only have a single VLAN and a single bridge domain associated to it. So that's the rules between this. Multiple EBGs per bridge domains, which could be multiple v VLANs per bridge domain, that could cause bridging loops in between these two different sites. So that's what we want to avoid. So that's why we're going to do one bridge domain equals one VLAN and one EPG. Typically, uh, this is a very, if you're similar, familiar with some of the terminology that we've used before, especially in designing our ACI networks, sometimes we refer to it as a network centric design and sometimes we refer to something else as a, um, a network centric design versus an application centric design. A network centric design is this, it's one bridge domain equals one EPG equals one VLAN. So if we do it that way, now that doesn't mean that every EPG, every, or sorry, every bridge domain that you create in your ACI fabrics need to be one EPG only with one VLAN only. But um, whatever you stretch between these two locations does need to be this way. Our options for interconnecting our dual multi-fabric is we need to do, we can do dark, dark fiber DWDM and do a back-to-back -back VPC. Just trunk VLANs over this uh, VPC here. Or we can do a DCI such as OTV in between these two locations or even Ethernet over MPLS pseudo-wire. Now, we don't really have the same latency requirements that we had for the multipod or the stretch fabric because we have two independent APIC clusters. We have two different fabrics, independent fabrics. So there's really no distance limitation that I'm aware of here, except for what is available in your, except for what your applications can tolerate. Again, this is something uh, I hammer every time I teach these stretch designs, these multi-data center designs. Um, if you stretch a multi, if you stretch a data center and you want to provide VM mobility, which is what we can do here, we can VM, uh, we can have a VM move from one location to another, depending on the hypervisor. But it is supported, so we can use the same address space in both locations. We still have a, whole, a number of other problems, such as how do we get traffic in and out? Uh, how do we get traffic in? Rather, uh, out is okay. It's pretty easy. Um, so our out traffic is not, not a problem there, but we do have an issue with um, the application latency. What, what sort of latency can the application uh, survive or even thrive in? So that's something to keep in mind. Just because you can have two locations that have the same IP space doesn't necessarily mean that you should. Now, multi-fabric layer two gateway. So we have a virtual machine that is sitting in fabric one its IP address is 192.168.1.100 slash 24, and its gateway address is 192.168.1.1. Pretty standard. In ACI, every leaf has the uh, is going to be our, our pervasive SVI, so the same address space is going to exist in every leaf and any cast gateway, rather than being up here, which is what we have with the with traditional like 7K, 5K pod topology. It's going to have a VMAC so that every one of these uh, leaves have the same MAC address so that if we migrate from one MAC uh, from one leaf to another we're still using the same MAC address uh, because of ARP and we're still using the same IP address because that's what's configured in our default gateway and our IP stack of our, our VM. And the problem with that is if we do a VM from one location to another our default gateways are still one of these uh, oops, are still one of those leaves so what do we do? We can configure what's called a common pervasive gateway so what we do is we configure the same gateway in both fabrics. Remember, we're still configuring these fabrics independently of each other. So we have to go into both fabrics and configure this, this virtual IP address. We need a local Glean IP address. So we need something that is going to be, that is something that is unique to each fabric. So 192.168.1.254 is local to this fabric. And then 192.168.1.253 is local to this fabric. They're each going to have their own MAC addresses, but they're going to share the VMAX and they're going to share the default gateway. So that way, when I move from one location to another, boom, now my default gateway is a local leaf instead of a remote leaf. So our multi-fabric configuration might look something like this. So we have ACI fabric number one, ACI fabric number two. Let's do a quick walkthrough. 
bridge domain A, bridge domain A. We need to create both of these bridge domains identically with the exception of we need to set those Glean IP addresses and so forth. But we need to configure them identically in both locations. So bridge domain A, bridge domain A, bridge domain B, bridge domain B. We've got a VM and then we're, we're going to do an extension of VLAN 100. So we're gonna um, make an, a single EPG and that EPG is going to be on uh, VLAN 100. And down here, it's going to be VLAN 200. So we're stretching VLAN 100 through a DCI, for example, OTV or dark fiber or across a VPC or something like that. This VM right here is going to be visible to this fabric via that leaf. It looks like it's a locally connected device. So if this app, if this app here, this VM, so this is app two, if it, if it, or let's say, let's do it this way. So the web server over here needs to make a connection into app number, uh, this VM here, which is called app two. What it's gonna do is it's going to see this VM, so this fabric will see it, this VM connected right here on, on whatever leaf this is. So it's gonna go through, connect through the fabric to this bridge domain, to this EPG, and will then get sent over to the, over that link, over that VLAN 200 link, and then go to that app there. The response will go like that as well through that contract. Again, also the contracts need to be synced up. So we need to have the same contract in both locations. If they get out of sync, we can have uh, unpredictable forwarding or unpredictable behavior. So that's something to keep in mind. So contracts, EPGs, bridge domains, ANPs must be kept configured separately on each fabric and kept synchronized. APIC does, the APIC itself does not provide uh, sync capability between two independent fabrics. So you have to either configure it manually by hand, you can do it through scripting through the REST API, uh, UCS Director has some workflows you can do for this, and also there's the ACI toolkit you can do through scripting and through the REST API. So that's... Um, uh, that's what that is there, and you can find that on GitHub.